Genesis chapter 18, and you turn there, and I'm going to ask you another question, okay? What does it take for God to bless you? Okay? Everybody wants God's blessings. I pray, I pray every day, I pray for the people of this church, I pray uh, when God brings them to mind, individual people. Um, I pray for the people that we have in the hospital right now. I pray for Bonnie and Roy. I pray for our ministry. I pray for the people of Kenya. Uh, I did. I prayed this morning. God, let it rain and let rain just move into that area and turn that area into a fruitful plain. Okay? I want that. Um, God may have a reason why it's not that way. I don't know his reasoning. But I would like for God to, to do a miracle and turn that plain that desert into a fruitful plain where grass and corn can grow and they can grow beans and they grow whatever they want to. That's what I prayed for. And, um, but I prayed that God's blessing would be on them. Okay? And when God's blessing is on someone, uh, God gives them things, God restores things, God helps them along in life, God helps them deal with the issues of life or God forgives their sins or what, whatever it is they need, that's a blessing in their life. And I pray that God would bless uh, different things, different people, our church, bless the ministry that God has given me, and making, hope, hopefully making it fruitful for him and his kingdom. And the question is, what does it take for someone to be blessed by God? Okay, uh, and I will ask this question. You don't necessarily have to answer. It's just uh, one of those rhetorical questions that I want you to think about. Can God bless somebody when they are in a state of disobedience to God? Can God bless that person? Okay, so let's read this in Genesis chapter 18. I have on the screen verse 9, but I want to read down to verse 9 so we get the whole story in the context of it. And we had... We had used this to deal with angels and angelology and devils and, and how they work and all that stuff. But now we're going to move on. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And, and My first thought would have been, oh, doggone it, now I've got to get out of the shade into the sun. Okay? Because he sits in the heat of the day. And, and when he saw them... He ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. Do not pass me by. Uh, pass, uh, pass not away. Uh, uh, I pray thee from thy servant. Verse 4. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. By the way, this, there is such thing as comfort food. Yes, sir. Biscuits and gravy will do it. Chicken and dumplings will do it. Amen. Good shepherd's pie, maybe a good pot pie or nice casserole. Those are all good comfort foods, right? Not, he's not talking about stuff that's good for you. He's talking about stuff that just makes you go, ah, I feel a lot better now. Doughy stuff, bread, you know, carbs. Um, Verse 6, And Abraham hasted into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into... I mean, he's running everywhere. This guy's old. He's running everywhere. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it to a young man. And he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and calf, which he had dressed, and set it before them. He stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Reminds me of the, the dear, sweet... Man, in Kenya, when I was out there preaching, um, we went to visit a place that they were building for like a, a, a Christian retreat. Some men were digging a well by hand and they were, you know, making bricks out there, making their own bricks. 
and, and building the building. And then a man came up with a goat on a rope. And I was afraid to ask, but the lady that was showing us around, she talked to the man and she said, this man is an elder uh, in this tribal area and he wants to give you this gift in appreciation for your ministry here. Handed me the goat. And I am thinking, how am I going to get this across customs? What am I going to, how am I going to get this goat to Missouri? And uh, so she, she told me later, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And I know what she did. She ate it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but anyway, verse 9. And they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. Now watch this. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of of women meaning she had gone through menopause she is now unable listen to this now she is no longer able to conceive a child it is not possible for her to conceive a child but God does the impossible somebody say amen he does the whatever you think God can't do. God can do it. Okay? I've seen it mo many times in my life. I have seen it in other people. I've seen people that I never thought God would deal with and work with. And all of a sudden, God's dealing with them and working with them. Amen? Let's... Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we move on. Heavenly Father, we pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd bless uh, the teaching of your word tonight. Open up our hearts, our eyes, our ears. And Father, Lord, just help us to comprehend what a good God you really are to us. In spite of our sins, in spite of our wicked nature, in spite of our flesh's rebellion to your law and your word, Father, you still bless us and give us of your grace. And Father, I stand in awe of a God who is so good to his people. Father, I just wish to convey tonight to anybody that would listen to this just how good you really are. Father, bless this message tonight. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Now you watch this. I am asking the question, can you be in a state of rebellion against God, a state of iniquity, a state of disbelief of God, and yet God bless you anyway? So verse 12, therefore Sarah laughed within herself, not out loud, she laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? In other words, not only am I too old, definitely he's too old. It'll never happen. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Remember, he's the Lord. He knows the thoughts of men. And I've, I've said this before. You will be judged. There is a book written in heaven by an angel who's writing down the things you said, the curse words you let out, the filthy jesting, the where your eyes went, what your eyes looked upon, what your ears heard, what you lusted after with your eyes, with your flesh, the pride, 
and the thought sins. There's an angel writing down all the sins that your heart commits against God. Writing those things down. And the Lord, even though she laughed within herself, the Lord knew it. Think about uh, Isaiah 14. Here's Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart. He never said it out loud, but he said it in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He thought all of those things in his heart and God knew it. And published it as a testimony against him. And I'm here to tell you, you can brag about what you did and didn't do, but your heart commits sins Every day. Every day. And an angel writes them down. And, the, and, and they have to be blotted out by the blood of Jesus. And so he says, wherefore did Sarah laugh? And verse 14. Is anything. It, write this down. Underline this verse. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too bad for God not to fix it. Nothing is too broken. Hey, nobody's too dead for God to not raise them up. The dry bones in the valley were laying there. You can't get any deader than that. God brought them back together, breathed life into them. They stood up a mighty army. Lazarus dead four days. I'm telling you, that is a bad, that is the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. Helping my brother-in-law pick up a four-day-old dead body. And I didn't get the worst of it. But it was the poor cop sitting out there in front of the trailer house that man lived in. Was sitting out there and he told Robert, he said, Unless you see a gun or a knife underneath that guy, I don't want to know about it. I ain't going in there. In other words, if he didn't die of natural causes... Then, if, Or if he died, just died of natural causes, I don't have to go in there. But if you find a gun or a knife, doggone it, I'm going to have to go in there and investigate it. He did not want to do that, all right? So anyway, is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now watch this now. She's already laughed within herself in disbelief of what God said. God called her on it. And now in verse 15, look at what she did. What did she do? She denied. Saying she lied out her teeth. Saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, nay, but thou didst laugh. Now, the question is, did she get the baby? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to go back to this question now. Is it possible that you can be in a state of sin, transgression, rebellion, and yet still be blessed by God? Yes. Huh? Yes. This church is full of people who while they were sinned, Sinners, God blessed them by saving them and forgiving them. Amen. Now think about this. Go, let's go through the Bible for a minute. In our minds, let's go through the Bible. What was the spiritual condition? What was the condition of the 11 brothers of Joseph? When they met Joseph in two years into the famine in Egypt, what was their condition... Or their standing with God and with Joseph when Joseph decided to bless them and give them all the food that they needed. Those 11 men hated Joseph. They swore to have him killed. They decided at the last minute to sell him into slavery. They hated his guts. They lied to their father. They took the blood of a goat and put it on his, his uh, coat of many colors. Ripped it, took it to their dad and say, a beast 
has killed your son. They lied to their father. Then they had to go back 22 years later and say, uh, Daddy, uh, remember that? Remember when we told you Joseph got killed by some beast? Uh, <laughs> you think this is funny. We lied. He's alive in Egypt and he wants to see his daddy. They were blessed being in a state of sin, hatred, animosity, having wanting their brother killed, guilty of it, guilty of lying. And yet God blessed them and saved them alive, did he not? Let's see here. What was the spiritual condition of Jacob when he received the blessing of Isaac as the firstborn son? What was he doing? Cheating, lying, pretending to be somebody that he wasn't, and his mama put him up to it. And yet, he received the blessing of God Anyway, let's, let's move a little ahead, a little further. Um, what was the condition of Samson when the Philistines surrounded the city that he was in, blocking the iron gate because they knew that he was inside the city? What was he doing in that city? Anybody know? No, it wasn't Delilah. It was some other harlot. See, that was Samson's weakness. He loved them sleazy gals. Anybody that put on a little perfume and a little makeup and acted like a sleaze, acted like a tease, that was Samson's weakness. He was in bed with a harlot, and yet he stood up, took the two iron gates, ripped them off the hinges. And see, I think this is a picture of Calvary. When Jesus said, uh, the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against thee. Samson took the gates that could not prevail against him. He took them up onto a hill, like Christ taking the cross to Calvary, winning the victory over the Philistines. And yet he was in bed with a harlot when that happened. And you can go all through the Bible and look at the condition of people when God calls them, when God picks them, when God blesses them. There is sin in their life. There is transgression in their life. There is rebellion. There is wickedness, adultery. There is drunkenness. There is ev everything that man can be guilty of these people in our Bible, these famous people in our Bible, were guilty of it, and yet God blessed them. Somebody say amen. I'm telling you, you serve a good God. A God that will bless you when you're not at your best. A God that will bless you even when you are at your worst. He will bless you. Now somebody said, now why would God do that? Because to those that are really His, when God, let's, let's say that, um, oh, I don't know, let's say that somebody was slipping up, had slipped up and got them some alcohol. They used to drink alcohol years ago and they kind of slipped up and went back and was pouring it down and they knew they shouldn't have done that. They knew it was wrong. And so they, they grabbed their Bible and started reading. And all of a sudden the Holy Ghost showed them something they'd never seen before. And oh, I mean the doodads came out and I mean they were looking at that. And all of a sudden they realized, man, here I have been drinking. And God has shown me one of the greatest things he's ever shown me in his word. And they break down and they say, God, why did you show me that? God, why did you, 
God, what, did, have, you not, have you not been here the last couple hours? God, why did you do that? And God says, because I love you. Because I care for you. Because I made a promise to you that I would be a father to you and you would be my son. And this time, rather than whipping you, I decided to bless you, to show you that I am a very merciful, good God to you. And the tears start running down this man's face as he calls up to the Lord and says, God, I love you. I'll serve you the rest of my life, God. That's the kind of God we serve, people. Don't be afraid of him. Don't be afraid of him. This is your father. This is the one that though you may not want him around, like, you know, like teenagers get, they don't want their mom and dad around, but as soon as like, something happens to the car, or as soon as they get in trouble, who do they call? Mom and dad. Mom, I need help. Dad, I need help. That's who they call. God's a good God. Amen. So he said, um, verse 13, The Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah last, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Verse 16, and the men rose up. Now, and, and what I like about this story, and Sarah itself, and this dawned on me one day, is that Sarah represents the old man. But in her is the new man. Literally. And the Bible talks about us having the new man in us, the inner man. The, the, that which is born of God in us. And see, that which is born of God in us cannot sin. When the flesh disobeyed God, that's the old man disobeying God. But the new man on the inside of you did not commit that sin. Because he is born of God. He cannot sin. And therein lies our hope. It is never, ever, ever in our flesh. It's in the new man that is in us. And this is why I believe God waited until Sarah was 90 years old. Way past the time of life. She represents the old man with the new man inside of her. Which was the man the child of promise that God made. See, God promised that if we would turn our life over to Him, He would put inside of us a new man and a new nature. And we have that new nature, that new man in us. And that spirit fights and wars against the flesh, does it not? The spirit truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. So in verse 16, the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stayed yet before the Lord. So somebody asked me the question, uh, and I brought this up here a while back, whether the three that came to Abraham was, in fact, the Godhead. 
And the answer is no. Number one, God the Father has never ever presented himself here on this earth and he will not. The earth, could not, the earth would shake violently and, and blow up if God did. Number two, you now see clearly in the scriptures that these two men are going towards Sodom. And when you get to uh, chapter 19, you'll see that the Bible then calls them two angels. Okay, to show you that these two men here are the same as the two angels that show up at Sodom. And this is establishing that fact for you. So, you know, when Paul said, you know, be careful to entertain strangers, for you might be entertaining an angel unaware. They can look like us, uh, be like us. I think that it's possible. I've had a couple of angel encounters. Um, can't really tell you why. I don't have, they never, they didn't show me their card. Hi, I'm an angel. Light didn't come down on their head, you know, like on the TV show. I'm an angel from God. Okay. That, nothing like that. It's just that, that, that's just what I think. Uh, I think. A while back, I told you this story. We had a barbecue out here. A man came by. We gave him a ton of food, let him eat here. And uh, a couple guys took him in the church van up. He's headed towards Chicago. They took him up almost to the JB Bridge and let him out. And by the time they turned the van around, that guy had disappeared. He was gone. I mean, he was gone. He wasn't anywhere. He wasn't walking down the highway. They couldn't see him anywhere. Nothing. That guy was gone. So it's possible that we entertain an angel here. And I'm, I'm glad that we treated him well. Okay? I am. Uh, you'll never know. But maybe, maybe that homeless guy. Maybe he is. And why can't God have black angels? Amen? So anyway, now in verse 23... And Abraham drew near and said, and, and this, now this shows us the mercy of God. The absolute mercy of God. When, when you're asking, why hasn't God destroyed America yet? Our cities are very corrupt. Chicago... Washington, D.C., New York City, Baltimore, St. Louis, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you name it. Uh, Portland, uh, Seattle. These places are extremely corrupt. They are full of wickedness, sin, rebellion to God. They are absolutely full of it. Why won't God destroy them? Well, look at this. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? So Abraham knows that Lot lives in Sodom. And he's hoping maybe that Lot has maybe converted some of the people of Sodom to worshiping God. So Abraham says in verse 24, Paraventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and, and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now you take that and, and you remember that. God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. It is not his nature. It's not in his character. It's not in his plan. It's not, it's not God who would ever destroy the righteous with the wicked. For those of you who are, and let me just say this to a lot of our internet people. For those of you who are scared out of your mind, that there is a plan to reduce the population of the earth down to a bare minimum, which means killing off 
some six to seven billion people by some nefarious means. Let me remind you of a God who will never allow the righteous to be destroyed with the wicked. This is our God we're talking about. You can say that the elite, they're the Illuminati, the New World Order people, they're the ones in charge and they have plans of killing us all. I will tell you that God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Did he do it to Sodom? No. What righteousness he found in Sodom, he took out of Sodom. They remained alive while everybody else died. Stop living in fear and read your Bible. Somebody say amen. So, um, verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Just 50 people. And I'll let the whole city live. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken up upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall be, lack five and of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? In other words, forty-five. If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Verse 29. And he's speaking, this is what they've called Abraham, the original Jew, Jew and God down. Okay? This is the Jew, Jewing him down. Okay? Uh, and he spake again, verse 29, and said, Peradventure, there should be found forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure, there should be thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Uh, and I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. The Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion. The Lord said, I've had enough. I'm leaving. I'm tired of dealing with these Jews. Continuing with Abraham, and Abraham returned into his place. God swore, if I find ten righteous people in Sodom, I will not destroy it. Now, how many ended up leaving Sodom? How many? Three. Lot, his two daughters, his wife was on her way out, but she went, My house, my furniture. My new kitchen. My sodomite neighbors. Turned into a pillar of salt. And I'm just saying to you tonight, God is a merciful, forgiving, loving God. Who if he had found ten righteous people. See... So we had Lot, his wife, his two daughters, and their two future husbands. That would have been six that could have escaped if they would have been four more somewhere. Then God would have, the angels would have found it out. God would not have destroyed those four cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Adma and Zeboim, I think is the other one. Those, God would not have destroyed them. But he didn't find ten. Ended up only being three. And so God had to keep his promise. And he ended up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. And... 
when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, he left absolutely nothing there. They think they found the area where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. There's still the remnant of what looks like buildings. They, they look like stone outcroppings, but there are 90 degree angles that join one another. So they look like walls with corners. And they look hard and stone, but you can literally take your hand and just grab it and just pull dust out. The reason why it hasn't disintegrated is that there is never rain there. It never rains in that area. They have found what looks like to be a sphinx in that area. They found the walls of the city. What you won't find is any vegetation. You won't, and when you don't find vegetation, then you don't find much of anything else either. And since it doesn't rain there, the remnants of that place is still there. It is ashes and dust and that's it and God said I'm going to wipe it out so that nothing lives there and God made a promise in Deuteronomy uh, 28 and 29 that if the Israelites turned over against God and left God God would destroy them the same way he destroyed Sodom and nothing would live there ever again and I can tell you that the nation of Israel not only tolerates sodomy, but Tel Aviv, the capital of Israel, is one of the largest sodomite communities in the world. There are even commercials that advertise trips to Tel Aviv. And you can tell because they use the, the six colors on their rainbow in the advertisement and they had these two women holding hands you know running along the beach in Tel Aviv or whatever they're they're at some big party and it is a big sodomite hangout and it may well be that God just might destroy that but because I believe in this country there are those who still believe God has not destroyed this nation yet amen let's stand to our feet and go to prayer appreciate you coming tonight father we thank you lord that when we are at our worst you are at your best father i have found many many times in my life where your blessing was upon me and it was absolutely undeserved. No way in the world could I have deserved the blessings that you've blessed me with. The things, Father, that you've given me out of Scripture. The things that you've allowed me to share with others. The blessings, dear God, that you've given me of my wife and my family and all my grandchildren and the people in this church, Lord, I love these people. Father, there's no way in the world that I have deserved any of this. You've given this to me totally undeserved, totally by grace. And Father, I just, I can't do anything but praise you for eternity for what you've done. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that these patriarchs in the Bible, these people, Lord, that are famous to us, these names we've heard since we were children, when we look at their lives, we find that they are just as sinful as we are. And yet you made promises to them and you've blessed them. And Lord, we just thank you, God, for blessing us the way you have. That you found us as sinners, not as saints. You found us as sinners. You brought us to Jesus. You made us into saints simply by your grace and our trust in you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight's teaching. Lord, show us your ways. Teach us of your ways. Bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.